Hello everyone, welcome to season two of MetalNet. I have a lot of great guests for you, starting with Johnny D of Doro. Johnny D is also known for being the drummer of Britney Fox, and I'm gonna to talk to him today about both of his experiences as well as how he started in his career and a lot more. So don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to like this video, and don't forget to leave a really nice comment for Johnny. Here we go. Um, speaking of Britney, um, how is it that you ended up in the band? Did they hire you directly or was that like a, did the label hire you to replace the drummer that they had in place? No, what happened was uh, I knew all the guys. Obviously I knew Billy from the basement days and um, Dean I had replaced on drums in another band and Michael uh, had really complimented me early on i think he was still in cinderella or maybe the first band out of cinderella um, and he saw me play with world war three and he was like dude i think you're great you know and if we could ever jam together that would be amazing and i was like yeah you know just let me know but i had actually like from that point forward gotten this wasted gig and i went to england and ended up on tour with Maiden and stuff. So I was like, wow, you know, and those guys were still in the clubs trying to get it together. And so um, when Tony Destra, the original drummer was killed in that car crash, when the band decided to continue, I got a call from them and said, hey man, you know, I think I was even there the night that that happened. So, I mean, we were in constant contact. And Billy and I were best friends for a long time, but uh, I got a call and it was like, hey, dude, we're, you know, we're going to be showcasing for some labels again. And, um, you know, they were on the verge of getting a deal when that the night that Tony passed, it was literally wow. him uh, rushing home to tell his girl that like they just showcased for a label and it was looking real good. So it was horrible timing and just an awful situation, but you know, they wanted to continue. They asked me to join. I was like, I'm on tour, like in England and Europe and dude, I'm like tripping, you know, I'm a rock star. I can't come back to <laughs> Philly and fucking play in a club, you know? I mean, if I were a gambler, like I would ride this hand out, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they were like, totally understand dude, right on. And then, so they got another friend of ours to come in. And then when it got to that point where they were signing the deal and they said again, like a Cinderella scene, Hey, we like the band drummer looks a bit mm, old or whatever it was, you know, um, okay, we know the guy, you know, and then Michael called me again. And he was like, Look, dude, you know, we have to switch Adam out our good friend, Adam Ferrioli took the, the, the spot in between. And, um, and at that time, I was in LA and wasted was looking like it was just gonna implode, you know, so I was like, Okay, now's the time, you know, so I just literally had to fly back home, jam with them, and and everything should be kosher and then you're in you know so it wasn't like an open call or anything it was literally like if you want the gig and you can do the gig then you can have the gig you know and, and we played together it sounded good and then the next thing i know we were like playing the last club shows before we went to record the first album cool how did yeah. you feel about um, it being a glam band? Like, I know that was the thing at the time, but were you into that? Like, did you, cause you were into a lot of those like theatrical bands as a kid, yeah. but did, are you as a musician, like, did, were you feeling that at the time? It was kind of a natural thing. I mean, even um, everybody was doing it at that time. Like, you know, it was like that following, you know, following footsteps of whoever i mean if you look back it was like even the bands that were not were the furthest thing from that ozzy for example totally you know, <laughs> i remember became, some of those outfits you're like ozzy really <laughs> right ozzy became liberace overnight and then the next thing you know it was like okay we got to do that you know so even these guys and wasted 
were like glamming up and teased hair and all this and then and it was not really them you know but we just were doing you know doing it and i you know happened to look good in tight pants and big hair <laughs> and i could make my hair it actually look, suited you like you were it like worked on you like it looked like organic on you it didn't yeah, feel like, you know a little bit <laughs> overblown but i mean at that time I mean, shit, you're not going to be like, hey, I'm not teasing my hair, you know, because it's <laughs> like if I tease my hair, maybe I'll be on TV, you know, or whatever. Right. So everybody's <laughs> just doing it. And uh, yeah, I mean, Britney was a little bit over the top for me. You know, they were wearing like freaking rouge and grandmom's mm. old pearl necklaces yep. and shit. And I was like, <laughs> what is this crap, you know? But I mean, being poor and not having money to, to get clothes made, you know, it was like, you just raid, raid whoever your girlfriends or your moms or grandmoms yeah. <laughs> shit and just like make an outfit out. You guys of it. had, what was it? Victorian. Um, there was like a term that you guys used for your particular type of, it was great. It was like Victorian something glam. I was like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. What was it? Was, it? There was a quote in Kerrang. It was like, uh, it was perfect. I wish I could remember it. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but it was. You It'll know, come it to was, me. It'll come to me. Yeah, <laughs> it was silly, and it was like oh, trashy it, Victorian glam. That's what it was. Trashy <laughs> Victorian glam. <laughs> it was, I still uh, love that. I'm not gonna I lie. I'm a glam girl. I make no apologies for any of it. I dressed the same way to school every day, and I loved it. It was great. It was just super fun. I mean, there was no like, you know, it was just fun. You know. I mean, I didn't even give a shit that like for half of my life, I was like whistled at by guys <laughs> or, you know, or called like the worst names and shit. It just made me want to do it even more. You know, it was like, you know, a big you probably got, You probably got more women than any of the people who are trashing on you. That's the, the, the craziest type. thing is the, the attraction you know, of women <laughs> to guys that look like women. It was like, okay, you know, I'm <laughs> down with that. Whatever works. That's funny. How do you feel about it now? I mean, uh, like, do you have any regrets or is it just like it was what it was and it was fun? Yeah, it was totally fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's still fun even to play that stuff or to, you know, to think about it or to see photos or to remember, you know, the memories of what of it all it was just like nothing but fun you know there was no no weirdness about it it was just like it was it was happening you know yeah. unfortunately we were a little bit on the like the, the the last wave the tail end of it all but it was still you know the ride wasn't that long but it was pretty pretty cool yeah um, and here's what's interesting, because I've heard you talk about the band. Um, so my question is, you had a good time, but obviously from the first album to the second album, a lot of things changed within the band. Did you realize during the first tour that things were going to be so drastically different for you as a band during the second like during the second album and that like did you feel it coming or did that did, did you not know that that was going to happen there was a, a a time where it was not really apparent because everything was just so amazing in the very beginning you know and then we you know we went from club tour to like the poison tour to the rat tour to Japan on New Year's Eve opening for Bon Jovi and 50,000 seat stadium, you know, in Tokyo and just like, and then like the label said, we want you guys off the road and to start making a new record. And we were like, what? Mm -hmm. Like we had got a gold album we had sold like 800,000 records and all of a sudden the record label says we want you to come off the road and start to do another and we're like why you know we could push this thing over platinum and totally kick ass you know but then you're like oh okay yeah we can't argue with the label because then they'll just be like okay next you know right 
So, okay, great. Now we have to start thinking about a new record. And then, you know, Dean was constantly writing and preparing, you know, he, he pretty much was doing what he had done all the way up to that point and just like writing song after song. And, um, but yeah, on the road, it was like weird because we were, you know, we were super busy and having great shows, but then there was like this, thing with Dean like it's like oh I have something to prove now you know what I mean like uh, I don't we're not gonna be wearing the shit that we wear we're gonna like dress down and stuff and be more serious you know to be taken more seriously and stuff like that and we were kind of like um why do you want to screw with like what we're doing you know it's totally working you know was this in reaction to the change that was kind of coming slash happening? Or was this just kind of like, a, I never wanted to do all of that. And now that, now that we sold a bunch of albums, I want to do what I really want to do. Um, I can't say, cause I don't really know what was in his head, but I know there was, it was a gradual, it wasn't like the grunge kick to the balls. It was pretty much like, um, he was really into the Black Crows at that time, which, I mean, we all were. It was a fucking right. cool rock band, but totally different, you know, yeah. influenced, different by, influenced by, you know, the Stones and Faces and stuff. And here we were by mm. like Sweet and Slade and Kiss and ACDC. And then, you know, he just kind of started doing this like, you know, more rooty thing. And it just wanted to like, I don't know really what started that. I don't know if it was Poison doing like some ballads with acoustic and every rose and we were on tour with them and people chatting in his ear and stuff like that. But it was like, it was a very abrupt thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a gradual thing, but you know, along with that it was just like the personality started to really like get under everybody's skin so we were here we were dealing with a guy that was like you know had a mind of his own and just like from creating this thing that actually like went to the next level and was working to all of a sudden say you know what you know i'm not influenced by paul stanley and tom Kiefer anymore now i want to do this Right. you know and we're just like and it sounds okay. like it wasn't a conversation at all it sounds like it was just a decision made by one person and who just decided it was going to move in this way pretty much yeah and it was um you know the band up until that point was like you know very equal in in a lot of things you know but i think um being on tour and being around a lot of other people and and having you know chatter in the ear and it's like hey dude you know if you wrote all the songs you know you know you can fucking do this and that and then it was like oh all of a sudden the band isn't as important anymore because you pretty much use the vehicle to get yourself to this point and now you want to like you know uh you know toss it or or move away from it or gain more control Mm -hmm. for yourself you know we tried to keep it an equal thing so we would just like have votes for certain things and and you know keep it more of a band vibe but that was becoming less and less and really tough to control on the road and uh in the studio when we went in to do the second record and what did the rest of the band want if if, if the band collectively had gotten what they want what would the second album have felt like and what would it have, what you what would you have looked at looked like uh i think i mean the second record had some some good moments on it you know and it also was in a positive way it was a little bit of a you know of a, a growth you know for us but i think if the three of us wanted to keep things simple and and you know stick with the the formula a little bit more you know um not get so far away from it literally on the second record you know we should have kind of just taken the first album and made it that much better but we tried to like over 
overstep, you know, overproduced. So more and, mature songs, maybe scale down the image a little bit, but not change it completely. Yeah, I mean, Dean wanted to go for this, you know, on one hand, it was like Black Crows. The other hand, it was like Def Leppard with like, you know, a thousand voices and, and overproduction kind of thing. And, you know, we were trying to like pull the reins in and hold it together into something that would be, you know, um, <clears throat> I guess not too far of a leap from what we had done because we didn't want to alienate any fans. And we right. honestly, the three of us really liked the, the, you know, the sound and the style of the first record. And there's a couple tunes that were leftovers on the second album from the, from the early days, mm -hmm. like plenty of love and stuff like that. But then we also had like dream on and, and a couple a long long way from home which were yeah like cool steps up the ladder a little bit you know road songs and just like you know okay we need a ballad or whatever but it's uh yeah that was a that was a tough time because it just so quickly just changed you know course and then it was like okay now we have to fight you know, fight against everything to get, you know, it's like kind of like pushing yourself in a snowstorm to try and, you know, fight the wind that's coming at your, at your head, you know, it's really a lot of work. So, and then when did you realize that he was going to be leaving you guys and uh, you'd be kind of moving along? Well, we knew, you know, we were just fighting all the time and it was like a constant battle, but we made it through making the record. Mm -hmm. And then we did the first video single standing in the shadows and that didn't really like do much, you know? So it was like, Oh boy, you know, but then we, um, uh, we went to Europe with Alice Cooper, which was a really cool thing. We're like, let's go to Europe and open up, try to open up that market. And, um, it was really cool and uh, it was a great tour and it was a cool opportunity to to tour with a legend like that and also to you know play to some european audiences because we did have <clears throat> kerrang support in england with the band band had a cover on kerrang magazine before they even had their record deal so there was like oh. you know legitimate um fans in England and in, in some parts of Europe so <clears throat> we went over there did quite well and while we were there we learned that we had the KISS tour in America so we were like completely freaking out psyched that we would get back onto a, a big tour like that you know and the record sort of continued to struggle a bit it wasn't really like out of the gate like the first one was you know so we were like shit what are we going to do well we'll get on the tour and we'll be back in front of big crowds and then that'll push everything like it did the first time you know and um as soon as we had that tour it was like all of a sudden it was not on you know so we found out that uh they wanted to postpone the tour for a couple months, mm -hmm. uh, either to, you know, let their record pick up or whatever reasoning they had. But by the time we got to that part of the, I mean, well, by the time we got to the rescheduling of the tour, uh, we weren't really doing good and we weren't really asked to be part of it, you know? Okay. So they were like, we're taking slaughter and their record was blowing up and we were just like petering out a bit. So we're like, shit, there were no other tours available. So we were like, we have to just go play clubs. Mm -hmm. And we did, and that was cool and all, but it was just like such a, a bummer and such a, a step backwards, you know? Well, because at that point you had done a lot of huge, huge tours back to back, right? Yeah, we just played arenas like for the whole length of the first album, you know, that's why we were bummed that, you know, the label didn't like let us jump on something else after that. But anyway, we did did this club tour. Uh, the record was just stalling. Uh, we put out Dream On and that was like 
you know, a, a bit of a fight because it's like, okay, MTV's only playing these like black and white artsy fartsy story videos now. So, okay, well, we have a good song. Let's just do this. And the f <laughs> a bit of trivia here, uh, Michael Bay mm -hmm. directed our Dream On video and went on to do like mega shit, you know, Transformers <laughs> and all that stuff. But yeah. So Dream On was like done and it got MTV liked it and they started playing it. And we are actually started getting some radio play too, because up until that point, we were literally a video band. Like right. we did not have a big radio base, you know, we had songs played, but, but like even the first album was literally sold all on the MTV play. Um, we well, so, had phenomenal videos for that first album. Yeah. Girl School is still one of the coolest videos ever. Yeah, that, that came out like, great. such a fun video. Yeah, that right. was just perfect for, you know, again, to credit Dean for, he had that concept like way, way back. And he was, you know, his big thing was like always promising chicks in the local scene that you're going to be in the Girl School video <laughs> when we make it. And they're like, what? <laughs> and which never happened anyway but it did come out great and i still i still love it too yeah so we um yeah we were just like getting some radio play with dream on and things were like picking up but here it was hard to really feel because we're in clubs kind of slogging it out to smaller crowds and you know and then there was this like sort of vibe just from Dean that it was like, what is going on, man? It's just like constantly arguing about direction. And he seems really like unhappy. And, and this is like bad, you know, we're like not getting along and, and, you know, sitting like apart from each other on the bus and that kind of shit started to really like, you know. Simmer. So with we, the band and Dean, like everybody, much, else, yeah. everybody else is more or less getting along. Yeah, I mean, every Britney Fox was not a uh, touchy feely band to begin with. I mean, it was like four completely different personalities, and everybody had their opinion. And when you have that, and you try to be like a, a unit of like equal say, right? It was like rough, you know. But um, but it definitely was like you know. There was all of that and then Dean, you know, he was like completely on his own. So he was basically unhappy. And I think he literally thought that like, well, I'm just going to scrap all of this and start over again. And that way I can have complete control and I can do whatever I want and I'll just hire a bunch of guys and they can, you know, they can do what I so a solo do. artist wrote. Yeah. And that was like, you know, I felt like that was a, a bad call on his part because he could have just done a record and got that shit out of his system. But he didn't. He resented us and the whole thing that like he just like, you know, kicked the baby out the door, you know what I mean? And like um, said, you know, I mean, we literally had like a, a meeting on tour on a night off up in your area, actually. I think we were supposed to play in, in Mass or somewhere the next day. And, uh, you know, our manager flew up from Philly. Like, dude, it's really bad. Like, he's fucking, you know, he's threatening to quit and stuff. And, you know, we got gigs and we got, you know, Dream Ons happening at radio now. And there's like a little bit, we're starting to get better money in clubs and stuff. And it was like, cool, you know, but he wasn't, he didn't care. And he just basically like uh, revealed to us that like he already had a band, you know, it was like, what you know like i have a fucking and band on with another band this yeah, whole time. Man, totally getting some strange on the side <laughs> and uh yeah we were like blown away by that and then you know he had pretty much pretty hot temper at times so we were like you know there was no logical conversation at that point he had it 
his mind made up and he was leaving and he was going to do his new band with a bunch of other guys and uh, take some of the songs or whatever. And he was like, you know, F you guys, you can have the name, whatever. I don't want any of it. And I'm out of here. And that was that. That's, you know, pretty much how it went down. So we were left with, uh, you know, canceled tour. We had the name, but we had nothing really to show for it. And that was like a huge bummer for us. Yeah. That really was not that long into the whole thing. I mean, we're talking <laughs> that really like, wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, within the space of like, you know, I don't know, two years or something, year and a half. Well, especially where you had such a great start. Yeah. You know, such a solid start where it felt like the audience embraced you right away and like you were saying with the MTV presence, not even like radio presence or all that, just MTV presence. Like someone like me just saw you, thought you were amazing about the album, you know, the whole bit and yeah. ready to go, just embraced you. Just, you were one of my bands. Period, yeah, you know? we were super lucky in that sense. But I think Dean thought in, in all, and that it was so easy mm. the first time around that why wouldn't it be that way to do it again by myself, you know, and not have to argue with three other guys or a manager to, to, to do what I want or what songs I want to put on a record and stuff. But I mean, you know, uh, time will tell you that it's not, you know, it's not that way. Yeah. Um, and did the record, uh, did the record company and management and all that, did they stick by you for the third album in that, or did they give you a hard time? They had a, um, well, they were pretty bummed out to say the least, but they had an option to pick up, you know, because we said we wanted to continue with uh, find another singer. And I think they had the uh, the option to do Dean's thing as well. But I think some probably uh, Polygram outbid them or wanted him and gave him more money. So we, you know, we had to take a lot of time to, to find a singer and to, you know, write some new tunes and stuff like that. So they had the option to check it out when we got to the point where we were ready and they did, and they were like, no, thanks. And then we went with uh, East West Atlantic. Okay. So he left you with the, he left you with the name, but that, that didn't really mean anything because you still ended up having to get a new label. And yeah. All that. yeah. 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 I mean, it was just having the name was, was, better you know not only because of all the fucking work we put into it and all the momentum that we had but to you know to start from scratch again would have been who knows you know so we thought it was worthy of of continuing and and keeping the band alive because we had so many fans that you know would have been a total bummer for everyone to to just bury it you know well, and great songs too, right? So you yeah. get, to, get to do the songs. Um, did Dean did Dean do the songs with his new band, or did he really leave, did he truly leave it all behind? Um, do you know? Do you know? Did not. I mean, he may have had some of the stuff that he was writing on tour ended up on his Black Eyed Susan album, but uh, as far as the Britney stuff, like he he wouldn't play any of that shit. So he, he really be, did leave it behind. <laughs> he would be adamant that he was not going to F and play that bullshit. You know, there was so much trash talking in the press wow. after that. It was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so G, how did you feel about moving forward? Are you glad that you continued and made the third album? And like, do you feel good about doing that still? Yeah, I think um, I'm probably most proud of the Bite Down Hard album yeah. because, yeah, I mean, because um, because we did pull it out, you know, and we, the three of us, you know, added another person and, and actually made a better record for, I think it was better than our second album because of all the negative crap, you know, we were like very um, focused um and really hungry to at least you know make a great record you know we didn't really know what would happen by the time we got on tour I mean things had 
drastically changed for that you know genre so it was like didn't really see that coming but we did lose some momentum but really we lost the momentum with with boys and heat so we were kind of like you know we, we can only go up you know from here and and we made a record that we're all proud of and still like and a lot of other people really dug it too some people that weren't even fans of the first two really dig that record you know because of tommy's voice and stuff right. like that and it's a little bit more um melodic and not as like scratchy and and you know so it was cool we really you know it was good that we did that i think and uh still have good memories of that that's good so over the years um <clears throat> i feel like you've gotten together and had sort of you come together and break up or what have you yeah is right now is britney fox active as a band no, no? okay no. Um, would you be open to putting it back together either with Tommy or with Dean? Um, well, I know that it won't happen with Dean, unfortunately. I mean, the time is kind of been and gone and, and, but he literally will not just shake that, you know, that ghost or whatever it is to him he's just wants nothing to do with it and now he's not even doing anything musically at all so i don't think he wants to to do that and i'm always open to you know to do it again obviously because the times that we did do it was so fun for me just to play those songs again and to, to actually see people still want to fucking hear the songs is is to me the reason enough to do it you know and i just never i'm just like really i don't know confused or just blown away that like everybody else doesn't feel the same way that i do you know <laughs> It's well, I, like, I imagine that part of it is that you're still out there. I mean, you play uh, maybe the, not the last couple of years, but I mean, you're still out there interacting with fans all the time. So you're having people walk up to you all the time talking about those albums yeah. um, and telling you how great they are. So you know that people want to see you guys playing like, you know, it firsthand. So um, and you're playing with Dora, you've been playing with Dora forever as well. So yeah. I think you're in a different boat than probably everybody else in that who's been in that band. Um, well, yeah, Bill, we definitely I mean, want to see you guys playing. That that goes without saying, right? The funny thing is, is that, you know, I know, well, Michael just doesn't want to tour, didn't want to tour, you know, so we got past that thing. But even Billy, for example, like he knows that there's people out there that really want to see the band and hear the band. But then it's like when you get out there, it's like it's a guy that just like, why are you even doing this? You know, it's <laughs> like if you don't really want to do it or you don't you know want to like just embrace it have fun and and you know have it be what it is you know like then why even bother so i, I that i don't understand but for me it's just like it's just you know it's amazing to, to be able to do that this far on you know to go back and play 30 some year old songs i mean and have people actually like know them and sing or whatever and get into it. I mean, that's like just, it's a no brainer, but you know, you can't really uh, expect everyone to have the same opinion. I saw you guys, um, uh, I was telling you, I lived in LA for a short time. I happened to be there when it was, I think it was the last show at, is it Irvine Meadows? It was like that big hair metal show. So I did get to yeah. see you play and it was so cool because it was one of those shows where it was a bunch of bands who I thought I had missed, like, oh, I'll never get to see, you know, like Pretty Boy Floyd or Britney Fox. It was like a bunch of bands. I was like, I'll never get to see them. And I got to mm. see a bunch of you guys. Yeah. Um, really cool show. It was really yeah. fun. That was a trip. Yeah. 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 I flew across the world for that one. It was like, <laughs> I played a gig with Doro in Belgium, like the night before. Oh, did you? Yeah, and I had to dr fly all the way, like 10 hour flight to LA. I literally got off the plane, ran to a car and drove all the way down to Irvine and literally got out of the car in my shit and went right on stage and missed like our set time by like five or 10 minutes. Oh, so wow. we played a really short set, yeah. but 
you know, we did it, we pulled it off and it was like yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. That was a great show. One of, it was one yeah. of my favorite shows, yeah. but uh, yeah. Who else played? Was it extreme? No, extreme played? wasn't that. That was Brett. I think Vin, Brett Michaels, Vince, Vixen, Lita, uh, LA guns, but I can't remember if they were like Tracy and I actually had to miss them. So I can't remember if they played together yeah, or separate. Brother. Yeah. Um, Kicks, I think, was there. There were so many bands, and it was yeah. hard because you were like couldn't catch everybody, right? Like you had to make choices, right? Um, which is like the hardest choice, like first world problems, but like right, <laughs> it's like yeah, festival like, <laughs> oh, But yeah, it was a lot, a lot of great brand, a lot of great bands. So I was glad I got to see you, got to see you play. Yeah, um, cool with Britney Fox. So yeah, so um, I don't know where you know what will happen at this point you know it's like time well corona kind of put the bummer on everything but uh you know i don't know what will happen but i like i said i'm always open to that yeah yeah well we'll see what happens with that but i know i'll get to see you with doro at some point so let's let's move to doro was doro the next gig that you had like big gig that you had after Britney Fox because I know you've been with her for almost 30 years now are you <laughs> is it 28 29 <laughs> like, like how many yeah. years has it been 28 years yeah I joined in 93 it was right literally right after the bite down hard tour I think there yeah. might have been a little bit of time in between there yeah but um yeah I kind of went home after the whole you know uh, bite down hard tour and that was just like drained everybody and the whole you know gotta say the grunge thing you know that was like literally the the tidal wave that sort of swept away a lot of the 80s bands and uh, just brought a whole new thing going on so um, all of that was just like okay go home and just like what just happened you know mm. so I was sitting at home and I had like a got a, a part-time job I was like shuttling bicyclists there was an area of my my um, my home area has a really cool bike trail along the Schuylkill River you know and it's like right around Valley Forge uh, National Park where you know uh I mean, it's legendary uh, history there, but yeah. <laughs> um, there was a bridge that was being repaired. So I had to literally shuttle bicyclists from one side of the river to the other in a little, you know, short bus with a trailer on the back. So I was doing this gig all summer for some money, which was cool because I had no, you know, nothing other to do than just like listen to music and read books and shit. But it was uh, then when I got a call from my friend Jimmy Delella, who said that who I had known was playing with Doro um, and it, it auditioned previously like in our area but he's like dude the drummer's leaving mm -hmm. he doesn't want to tour in Germany and like I told Doro that like you're the dude you got to do this and I was like when do I leave you know I'm ready to fucking go man He's like, all right, I'll call you back. And then he, you know, talked to her about it. And he was like, my friend Johnny from Britney Fox is available and he's great and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, Britney Fox, I love that song, Save the Week or whatever. She like, she, because Warlock and Britney were on MTV around the same time, you know? So she yeah. knew who I was and stuff. And uh, yeah, so she literally came to Philly to, play together and just kind of like feel it out and um yeah and then two weeks later I was in Germany like preparing for a, a tour so it was really like a, a last minute thing that came really luckily and and super cool you know because it kind of opened me up to this European thing after being in America and having this whole like dark cloud come yeah. over being over there was like holy shit man there's still like big gigs happening with metal and like yeah, you they know. didn't seem to be aware of the fact that this cloud had come over uh metal in this country right like i feel uh, like all the 
rock magazines and everything still had all the metal people on the covers and you know like the guitar magazine stuff always had like Nuno and everybody like it was yeah. like nothing had changed over there so I had a question for you about Doro now this is after Doro had lost the warlock name and started working under her own name right yeah. um so when you joined Dora was she she was still able to do warlock songs just not under the warlock name is that correct, correct. yeah okay so she was doing stuff that she had done under the Dora name like all of her albums plus warlock songs were you yeah. really i mean everybody knows who Doro is obviously because she's Doro but yeah. were you familiar like really familiar with the music or did you have to like uh, familiarize yourself with all the warlock and early Doro stuff uh, well I knew the triumph and agony album because that was yeah. like the big Legendary. one was, yeah um so I was familiar with that but I didn't really get into them as much to go hey I need to go back and check out their earlier stuff you know I just really only knew that record because I'd seen all we are on on MTV and uh checked the record out and there was a lot of really good stuff on there but um yeah I had to learn man like two two and a half hours of music to to play like and we cut a live album like six five or six shows into the tour so it was like damn I gotta do my homework you know and then, <laughs> it's gonna be recorded and I need to know it <laughs> yeah but it was a cool challenge I mean sometimes a challenge like that can really you know make things exciting and man it just was a fucking great band at that point it was like four american guys and doro so it was like and we were all from pa jersey mm -hmm. area so it was like the coolest dudes and the coolest kick-ass band and just here's this like crazy screaming banshee front woman you know this little <laughs> blonde you know thing that was just like wow and then you know the ballads and the like the sensitive side of, yeah. of things was like whoa man you know like I didn't really ever have to play stuff like that so I had to like literally learn how to support you know a singer like that like a sensitive thing you know where she's like vibing out big time it's not like some lunky dude with a guitar screaming I mean this was like a whole different thing for me so that was that was a cool challenge too and I, I think I got better as a player by having to do that um Dora's really great at creating um like this world she's created this universe you know for her fans um and she does it with songs with albums and just with her entire career how does she bring you all into the fold I mean I know you've been with her for a very long time now but over the years she's worked with different groupings of musicians so what's that process like when she brings you in does she bring you in you know ahead of time does she bring you in when you're in the studio how does that work because she's really so great at it I mean down to like everything I mean like when she does these box sets she really thinks about like every piece of art you know some of them this yeah. one had perfume in it this one had patches in it like she just is so meticulous down to like the last emotion what's that process like as part of her band it's um it's different at times it's um you're supporting a solo artist and at mm -hmm. other times you're like a gang that's just going to kick the shit out of people. I mean, it's really like you have to just follow her lead. And the same with making a record. I mean, sometimes she'll literally do, you know, a few tracks, just her and her producer. And that's it. It's on the record. And, you know, we learn it just like we learn a cover song or whatever to play. And then there's other tracks where she's like, guys, I know this needs, you know, you guys on it and stuff. So when, you know, in between, sometimes like in between summer festivals, we were in, before I moved here, we would be over here for like the whole summer and we would go in to cut some tracks in between shows like on the weekends and stuff like that and uh so it literally is like like i said sometimes it's like you're just a hired gun right. uh supporting you know a solo artist and then other times you know when she needs that support or when she obviously live 
the band comes into much more play or much more of its own thing. Um, and then we're, we're a band and, you know, or we're on tour in America and we're all like, you know, traveling in a bus together and just like, you know, we're like a family also. So it's, um, it's been, you know, a little bit of everything. It's always different, but it's always her choice. You know, it's her vision. It's her everything. So it's like you, and I'm cool with that. I mean, I, I'm being a drummer, I think, uh, or the kind of drummer I am, it's always a, in a support situation, you know, I've always been the guy that like tries to mediate even in Britney and stuff. I was always the guy that would like, okay, well, I'm not the dude saying like, I do everything and I'm not the guy that does nothing. I'm somewhere in the middle trying to just like, would you fucking assholes calm down and just like, <laughs> let's do this, you know? So, and that's why it works. Cause there's a vision, there's Doro, you know, she's the, the star you know and it's like I can support her and she gives me my time to shine you know I do a solo in every show and and it's like I get my time with the crowd or I can you know tour manage sometimes if she needs me to yeah, or... yeah I actually read about that um so how did that come about that you is it in the states that you sometimes tour manage yeah uh, how did that come about for you um, it just came about like, cause I just, you know, I started showing interest or wanting to do it just from, from early on. I mean, the, one of the reunions, uh, that Brittany did in like 2000, when we did a live record, um, I was in Doro at that time. And, uh, you know, we were getting ready to do some gigs in the states and Dora was like oh, oh I want to I want to be on that tour and I was like Dora like what do you mean like you want to open for Britney Fox and she's like <laughs> I, I don't really care like we can <laughs> tour together and you can play both you know and I was like uh, I don't know if I like that idea <laughs> you know so here I am lasting actually <laughs> yeah I here I am double duty uh, on drums and also trying to like tour manage and help you know book the gigs and get the bus you know from here to there and it just kind of started like that and then she was like you know the first tours we did in the states were very low key low budget operations couldn't afford to fly a german guy over to do a high priced tour management gig so i was like i can do it you know and i'm not like you know the most organized person but it's like when i have a challenge like that i can actually you know do a pretty good job at it you know it's obviously <laughs> pretty tough to do drums and tour manage well i was going to ask you that um it's putting on both hats just being the creative guy who could just sit back and just play and then having to turn off the worrying about is everything going to show up when it's supposed to the minute I well, stop playing yeah because then I'm on stage and I'm like who is that asshole filming he doesn't have a <laughs> pass to do that and I'm like ready to jump off the kit and go get the guy and I'm like, wait I can't do that I gotta smile and have fun right. and play and uh, <laughs> it's funny but yeah she's like she liked it and she felt comfortable with me doing it so it just kind of became that and i did like you know six or seven tours of of the us oh, wow. that way but then i love going back to europe where i can just like be the drummer and do other shit. yeah but now you live in europe so now she's probably going to be looking to you like you know stuff now you know places um, <laughs> you no know, germany no we have other good people to do that gig for us <laughs> oh that's cool though um so hey can you tell me a little bit about um triumph and agony live i know you weren't on the original album because you weren't in the band yet but our right. friend tommy bolin uh, who i've had on as a guest and who's coming back again he was on the original triumph and agony album yeah. which in my opinion is one of the best 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 metal albums ever um and tell me about how this came about yeah, well, the time came about where it was uh, the 30 year anniversary of the record. 
and Doro um, was still, I think it was pretty recent where she just won the name Warlock back. Mm -hmm. So there was like, you know, all this talk of like, can the band, and, the, and that band has done some smaller type reunion stuff over the years, like, but she always sort of just made it a part of like a bigger Doro gig and stuff. Cause I, I think she feels like she put so much into being Doro over those years that it would kind of be, I don't know, a little detrimental to go back, you know, even though they kind of got like a little slot and we did it like, for example, we do these anniversary gigs. We did a 20 year anniversary, 25 and a 30 year uh, Doro anniversary. And um, a couple of them, Warlock kind of came in and did, you know, a short set in between what we were, our headline show was. So um, she was just like, hey, you know, this this is a big anniversary of, of you know, our one of our biggest records and uh, it would be cool to do something to acknowledge that, to celebrate that. So, you know, she started talking to Tommy mm -hmm. and said, you know, we'd like to bring you in as a special guest and we would, you know, um, he had come in and, and done some stuff, you know, but uh, this would be performing the whole record, you know, in its entirety and uh, at some festivals, which, you know, you get special billing or at least, you know, hey, this is the only show you're going to be able to see this at. And it's like creates a little bit more excitement and for the fans and, and, you know, some of those tunes, they never played live at all, you know? So that was the instigator of it all. And then we did like five shows in the U S and then we got uh, some festival billings in Europe and we did the show with Tommy and um, yeah, one of them was Sweden rock, which was like, it's such a cool, festival and uh just was a really uh, a cool opportunity to to record this record uh we already had video and we did you know the audio stuff and uh she wanted to make it something special and put out you know the 30 year celebration of that record and just you know put a little modern twist on it and uh yeah it was fun really cool to learn learn the whole album and to play it live and uh it took a few years to you know because I think it's like that was already like four some years ago and uh but yeah it finally came together I think corona helped get it <laughs> done you know and, uh, yeah yeah. It was cool. And she put out a couple of versions. I, I got the one that has um the cassette, which is how I originally had Triumph and Agony. So that was, even though I have no way to play it, it was kind of a kick to get that. Yeah. Um, and it was cool because you were talking about the Doro and Warlock name. Um, she actually has Doro on top and Warlock at the bottom. So it's interesting that she uh, totally makes sense. I would do the same thing if I were her. Like yeah. she had to work to establish both names. So good yeah. for her, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's really cool. Um I was, I was excited to get that and acknowledge yeah, of this amazing album. Definitely make some amazing packages. You even, this is my favorite. The other one. Yeah. I'm going, I'm doing a new jean jacket uh, and, and the buttons, like all the stuff that we had when we were 12, basically. Yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah, she does like all that stuff, you know, and it's cool yeah. to, you know, I mean, not a lot of people buy physical stuff anymore, but it's like, if you feel like, man, you're getting something for your, for your yeah. money, it's like cool to hold something tangible and, and be like, you know, wow. Yeah, this was yeah. cool too. Uh, this was fun too. And they, I mean, they both came out during this time. So it really gave us all something to look forward to. I have her perfume over there and this one had the headband. And uh, I think she did the last thing with um, the, the, magic diamonds one where i think there were a couple options here too i just love that she really goes the extra mile because not everybody makes the effort yeah that but i think you know i think a lot of metalheads are collectors you know so yeah it's nice to have uh extra bits you know to look at or to collect or whatever it is you know but man she's been you know pretty 
putting out a lot of stuff in the last couple of years, you know, a double record, then the greatest hits package thing there with some cool live stuff on it. And then the whole triumph and agony uh, update. I mean, it's like, man, she never slows down. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you've had an amazing career and um, I am looking forward to when we can go to shows again, because I'm excited to see you with Doro and I'm all definitely be coming up to see you. Um, but the one thing that I love to ask musicians, especially ones with careers like yours, is um, what advice would you give to musicians? It's a totally different landscape than where you started, but you've survived it. And um, there are always musicians coming up uh, and particularly those who wanna play metal. And um, what advice would you give to them? Um, somebody starting a career or even somebody who's you know maybe closer to our age who still wants to pursue a career, what advice do you have for them? Well, I'd say, you know, I think the opportunities are, out there they're much different now but they're still you know there's a lot of bands that are kind of doing the independent thing and doing quite well at it just basically making a good record on a small budget and releasing it on you know either an indie or a european label or whatever it may be um, having more control over their music but i would say just overall to um just enjoy making the music that you're doing, you know? Um, but obviously there's sacrifices, you know, it's, it's different now. I mean, it's, I could probably give better advice to somebody if the, the playing field was more um, similar to what I experienced, you know, and now there's a lot of aspects that I don't even really have a, a handle on, you know, that have come, you know, come along while I've been kind of working this old school thing, you know, um, but uh, I think it's, there's some opportunities that are better now, you know, to do your own thing and to, with the internet and with all the ability to contact fans, be in close contact with them and stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, just really, it's not like you're signing your life away. Like, you know, in the past where you would sell a million records and not even see, you know, a small percentage of that. Now you can basically, you know, do it on your own DIY and maybe actually make money from it. But a lot of guys are, are you know, um, they have careers other than music and they're just able to afford gear. You know, they're still talented writers or whatever instrument they're doing they can make a record in their spare time some dudes go on tour on during their summer vacation or whatever like that i mean there's people are really have found ways to make it work you know i would say whatever it is you're really your personal goal is you know to just follow that kind of path and just you know figure out how to achieve that as opposed to you know this thing of like hey man we're gonna get signed and when we get signed like everything will be hunky-dory you know what i mean when we all found out like that was only the beginning of the bullshit problems you know it's like you walk in a door and realize there's like a thousand more doors there, you know, in front of you. But yeah, I would just say um, just to be cool, enjoy, you know, playing music with people that you like to be around. And that's like the probably the best thing that you can do, you know. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on. Um, it's a total honor to interview you and I'm glad to have you on. Hopefully you'll come on again and super looking forward to seeing you play live. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. That's awesome. Of course. And I just want to remind everybody who's watching to subscribe to this channel, to like this interview and to leave a really nice comment for Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> I like nice comments. Yeah. Only nice comments. Cause no, what, else, what other kinds, like what other kinds should you leave really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching this video. And again, don't forget to subscribe. I have a lot of amazing guests coming up in season two. I had a lot of amazing guests in season one. Make sure you check out all those videos. 
thumbs up everything, leave nice comments for everyone, and see you guys soon for the next video. Take care.